If you have your Bible, I love saying that. <laughs> if you have your Bible, if not, just listen in. If you don't have a Bible, you can still listen. Look it up later. Write down the notes. Google the verses. You can do that. You can, you can Google the verses. You can ask AI, hey, what does Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 in the King James Version say? Amen. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the same verse that we used the last time we got together. God's not finished with this verse. And hey, God's not finished with you. And God's not finished with me. We're not a finished product. And we're not going to be a finished product until we see Him face to face. Until we look Him in the eye. Glory to God. But that day is coming. For the Bible says, Every eye shall see Him when He comes. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, the words of God. It's storming outside. As I'm preaching this message, it's a storm. It's a flood warning. Like Noah gave the ancient world flood warning. They didn't listen. But I tell you right now, it's storming. And a storm of the judgment of God called the Great Tribulation is coming on this world. The day of the Lord. Judgment day is coming. Are you ready? So while it's storming on the outside, hallelujah, God wants to send the good rain. The spiritual rain, the latter rain, the river of God on you. And it flows from His Word. I know, Jeremiah 29, 11, the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Father, as we begin today, we thank you so much for your holy, inspired, infallible and an errant word. And we pray today that the teacher would come. I pray, O oh God, that you make these lips and my tongue as of the pen of a ready writer. God, we take no glory, no money, no celebrity from this. But we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. And we ask that everything be done to the praise of the glory of your grace. Hide me behind the cross as we minister today. And let your will be done and your kingdom come in this service. And we pray it in Jesus' mighty name. We pray that the conviction of the Holy Spirit will move over the audience, convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, drawing them to the bleeding side of Calvary. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And amen. The Greek word for salvation, for which we say getting saved, is sozo. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly according to the Greek scholars. And they tell us that that word translated salvation in your Bible actually means in the original languages deliverance <laughs> or freedom. And as I preached to you yesterday, that's what it's all about. In our salvation in Jesus Christ, we not only get our sins forgiven, remitted, and redeemed by the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. But not only that, our bodies can be healed. Our physical bodies, healing is in the atonement. Our physical bodies can be healed. Glory be to God because Jesus bore our sickness and carried our diseases. Matthew eight seventeen, And all that is included in your salvation. But not only that, also deliverance. And this is God's will. God doesn't want you walking around sick, diseased, bound, afflicted, and tormented. There was a woman who, who the devil had bound, I think it was 14 years. 14 years with a spirit of infirmity. And Jesus said to the religious leaders of Israel, Ought not this woman, whom Satan has bound all these years, be loosed, be loosed. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, Loose him and let him go. And that's what God Almighty says to you today. Whatever is binding you, whatever is tormenting and torturing you, you can be loosed, you can be loosed, and you can be free. Hallelujah, Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go. A new exodus is coming today. A wave of deliverance and a healing is coming. And freedom and victory. Hallelujah in Jesus Christ. And that's what our text meant. 
the perfect will of God. And salvation, healing, deliverance, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I told you yesterday that God wants us healed, saved, delivered, and filled with the Spirit. All of us. There's no exception. God doesn't have one will or one word for your neighbor over there and another for you. No. Jesus died for everybody. John 3.16, God so loved the whole stinking, rotten, pathetic, fallen world that he gave his only son. Hallelujah. And that means you. That means you. That means you can, can, can drink from the water of life freely. Freely you've received. Freely give. It came for you. It came for everybody. There's no exceptions. There's no exclusions. There's no exemptions or escape clauses. It's for you. It's for your neighbor. It's for the person from India, the Russian. The Chinese, it's for Afghanistan, it's for Israel, it's for Australia, the islands of the sea, Saudi Arabia, and the United States of America. The perfect will of God is our salvation, our healing, our deliverance. But why doesn't it always happen? I started talking about this yesterday. There is the perfect will of God. There's also the permissive will of God. Amen. Amen. There are things God causes. There's things God tolerates. The perfect will of God is not always done. We're not AI. We're not robots. We have a free will. God does not impose His will on you. He gives every human being a choice. And He says, choose you this day whom you shall serve. He says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life. But he won't make you. This is not the Crusades. I'm not coming here preaching with a gun. At gunpoint. Holding a gun to your head. Bang, bang. And saying you have to be saved. No, we don't do Crusades. We don't force people to get saved. We don't legislate morality. No, we give you a choice. And God calls every man, woman, boy, girl, teenager, young adult, young professional to a choice. To a decision point. But he won't make you. And so if a human being chooses not to walk in the perfect will of God, things happen. Negative things. We see in the fall of man, in the sin nature, in original sin. You see, man never had to be sick, diseased, or afflicted. Sickness is only because man sinned in the Garden of Eden. And we're sinners by nature and we're sinners by choice. That's why there's COVID-19, Delta virus, and all sickness. And that's why there's cancer and heart disease. Because man sinned against God. There was, no, there was no sickness. Man was designed to live forever. But we sinned. We sinned. And the wages of that sin is death. See, that was not God's perfect will. God put Adam and Eve in the garden. He never intended for them to die or get sick, but they chose. They chose to listen to the lies of Lucifer like so many of you had. And they died. They died spiritually. They died. They died eventually physically. And they faced the second death. And they face sickness and disease. And our world is literally littered with graves because of sin. Man's inhumanity to man is because of sin. Because of the sins of the fallen sons of Adam's lost race. This mortal coil is littered with graves. That's not God's perfect will. God's perfect will is not that you die lost and go to hell. God's perfect will is not that your body be riddled with cancer, sickness, disease. That you be hooked up on a vent where it's hard to repent and you, and you try to get another breath. That's not God's will. God's perfect will is not to send plagues, pestilences, and pandemics on society. That's not God's perfect will. But if you sin, if humanity sins, and follows humanism instead of holiness. The New Age instead of the New Testament. Atheism instead of Almighty God. Agnosticism instead of Almighty God. God permits things. God allows things. And we call this the permissive will of God. So, what I'm doing in the last message and in this one, basically I'm preaching your favorite verses, but I'm going to preach them in their original context, amen, instead of yanking them out of context. 
Basically, what we're doing is we're giving you God's greatest hits album. Amen. We're going through everybody's faith. We've already covered John 3.16, but how many of you know there's also a verse 17, verse 18 and 19. Everybody can quote John 3.16. But how many can quote verse 17? He that believeth not is condemned already. You see, the Bible is good news. It's good news. <laughs> it's the gospel. It's good news. It's the grace of God. The goodness of God. The unmerited favor of God. But the good news rejected is bad news received. The love of God rejected. John 3.16 leads to the wrath of God received. John 3, 17, 18, and 19. Read your Bible. Everybody knows that everybody's favorite verse is Matthew 7, 1. It's the verse, sinners know the heart. Judge not, lest you be judged. So I get it in the mail of the day. Don't judge me, Brother Mike. Don't be judgmental now, Brother Mike. You're too judgy, Brother Mike. Well, <laughs> you ever read the context? The context of the four Gospels, in John 7, 24, Jesus says, judge righteous judgment. Amen. There's good judgment and there's bad judgment. You ever look in the Old Testament, if judging is always wrong, why is there a book of Judges? And why did God call Judges? Now don't shut me down just because I'm preaching real good. You have to rightly divide the Word of God. But unfortunately, so many of you are wrongly dividing the Word of God. And that's why you get in trouble. Because you don't take your favorite verses on God's greatest hits album in their context. So basically, what I'm doing today, I'm playing DJ. I don't normally play requests or take requests. Amen? But today, I'm preaching and I'm playing requests today. Request texts. And I normally do originals. But today, I'm doing covers. I normally preach from verses and passages that no other preacher will touch with a 10-foot pole. But today, I'm covering verses that are talked about. They are preached about all the time. The verses that I'm using today are Peep's favorite verses. But I want to look at them in their context to avoid the God con. You see, if you take a verse out of its context, C-O-N, preachers can con C-O-N the people, be con artists, and have what I call the God con. Look, as we begin today, let me tell you this. You cannot have, claim, stand on, believe, and confess a text without its context. So, with that having been said, I want you to flip over to the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. And this one goes right along with our text. And a lot of people love it. This is a lot of people's favorite verse right here. And it should be. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Glory to God. Thank God. The old song says, oh, how he loves you and me. <laughs> when I was knee high to a grasshopper, when I, when I was this little, I learned to sing, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And it goes on to say, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. Hallelujah. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And you and everybody enough to be stripped naked, to hang upon a cross, to take a crown of thorns on His head, to take 39 lashes from the lictor's lash, literally riveting His flesh, to have spikes through His wrist, to have nails through His feet, to die to be 
asphyxicated with the stipa and the pontibulum to bear your sins as a sin offering and a sin substitute. That's love. Oh, what love. Oh, what love. Oh, what love. And if that isn't love, then love doesn't exist. But ladies and gentlemen, context being what it is, <laughs> there is a flip side to God's number one record of all the ages. John 3.16 is the most popular verse. People hold a sign. You, you look at a sporting event, people hold a sign. John 3.16. It is the most well-known verse, and, and for good reason, because it's beautiful. But for every number one record, back when they used to have LPs and they used to have 45s, for every number one record, for every number one record, that was a flip side. And sometimes it was obscure. It wasn't heard as much. It wasn't a number one record, but it was on the same album. It was the flip side. There is a flip side to John 3.16. There is a flip side, ladies and gentlemen, to Jeremiah 29. And verse 11. So I want us, without taking a tremendous amount of time, I want us to look back. I want us to look back at the context in the book of Jeremiah. Because God forbid you take that one verse and you try to have your whole theology stand on that one verse. And you don't understand the historic occasion. Israel was captive in Babylon because of the sin of idolatry. God had raised up Nebuchadnezzar to take God's own people as a disciplinary measure into captivity in Babylon. And every prophet other than Jeremiah had said it would not happen. Oh, only prosperity, only good things, only peace and safety. We're never going to be taken captive. But Jeremiah said, because of the sin of idolatry, imagery, and iconotry, idols, images, and icons, idols, images, and icons, idols, images, and icons because of your sin, because of your spiritual adultery and your spiritual fornication, you will be taken captive into Babylon. But instead of receiving Jeremiah's message, they did to Jeremiah like my fellow preachers, my peers and contemporaries in the pulpits of America do today. They blocked him they, like they blocked me. They defrocked him. They mocked him. They belittled him. They lampooned him. They caricatured him. And they put him in prison. For one crime. <laughs> Preaching the truth. But look what happened. What Jeremiah said happened. And the false prophets, what they said, did not happen. I'm going to get in trouble for preaching this. People are not going to like what I'm preaching. People are going to turn me off. They're going to unfriend me. They're going to unfollow me. But I can't help that. Notice what God said in Jeremiah 23 in verse 1. It's the same book that has 29 11. He says, Woe, that's a strong word. Woe be to the pastors. Oh boy. Woe be to Joel Osteen and Joseph Prince and Gabriel Swaggart and Jensen Franklin and Franklin Gray and T.D. Jakes, and Creflo Almighty Dollar, and Paula White, and Benny Hinn, and Matthew Crouch. Woe! Be unto Stephen Furtick and John Hagee and Greg Laurie. Woe be unto the pastors. Why? Because they destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastors. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, 
You have scattered my flock and driven them away. You're purpose driven, but you're driving them to hell, Rick Warren. You're purpose driven, Rick Warren, but you're driving them to hell. And you're a worse driver than Tiger Woods driving off the cliff into apostasy. And we pray for Tiger Woods' full recovery. I've been praying for Tiger and interceding for his total healing in the name of Jesus for months now. And behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, says the Lord. And I want you to flip down to verse 10. And God was talking about Israel before it went into captivity, but He just may as well and might as well be talking about America right now in 2021. He says, For the land is full of adulterers, for because of swearing, the land mourneth. The pleasant places, the vulgarity, the wickedness, the way we talk. The profanity. Their course is evil. Their force is not right. Look at verse 11. For both prophet and priest are profane. Profane. You can't even talk without cursing and cussing. They're profane. Yea, in my house I found the wickedness, says the Lord. Verse 13, I've seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal. They prophet and caused Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets, the prophets, listen to me, you people that call yourself prophets and apostles, I have seen in the prophets a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They commit adultery. They can't keep it in their pants. They molest. They abuse. They harass. They rape. They have fornication. Pornography. They walk in lies. They can't tell the truth. And they love liars. They strengthen the hands of the evildoers. And look at the end of verse 14. You're not going to believe what he says. And they're all of them like Sodom and like the inhabitants of Gomorrah. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's how God looks at America today and the American church. The American church is the whore of Babylon. Look what he says in verse 17. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, you'll have peace. See, this is what they say. They say, oh, COVID-19 is not from God. The Delta variant is not from God. Hurricane Ida is not from God. The Afghanistan collapse and the border crisis is not God's judgment. This is not God's judgment. You will have peace, safety, peace and safety, peace and safety. But sudden destruction actually comes. You'll have peace. They say to everyone that walks after the imagination of his heart, no evil. <laughs> no evil. And that's what the pulpits are saying. That's what Joel Osteen and all of them are saying today. TBN, uh, Marcus Lamb at Daystar. Oh, CBN and Virginia Beach. Everything's going to, I got a feeling, everything's going to be all right. It's going to go back to normal. Peace and safety. Listen to me. No, it's not. The judging hand, the wrath, and the vengeance of God is upon America. And this evangelist, Michael Dial, Mike Dial, is calling America to repentance. And like Jeremiah, I tell you, bad things are coming, thing, coming. Bad things, man. Bad things, man. I don't have time to read all this. But verse 25, I've heard what the prophet said that prophesy lies in my name. See, they preach in the name of Jesus. They call themselves mega church pastors, media church pastors, electronic church pastors, reverend this, doctor that. They speak in the name of Jesus. But what they prophesy is lies. The prosperity gospel is a lie. Purpose driven is a lie. The psychological Christian psychology, Christian rock and roll, it's a lie. Positive confession, positive thinking. It's a lie. Ecumenicism is a lie. Every time Pope Francis Pontifex opens his mouth, it's a lie. Verse 32, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams. And we could go on. Verse 36, you have perverted the words of the living God. Verse 39, I will cast you out of my presence. Real briefly, as we look at the profanity, the perverseness, and the false prophets, real briefly, 
let me give you the nine L's of Laodicea. That's where we live right now. We say our positive confession, our positive thinking, our faith confession, I'm rich and increased with goods. I'm rich and increased with goods. I got all this money. That's the confession of the church. I'm rich, increased with goods. I got all this money. Look at what I got. And they boast and they brag. But Ephesians says, don't boast. Don't brag. But we do. I'm rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. God supplies all my need. Philippians 14, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. God says, no, you're poor. You're miserable. You're blind. And you're naked. And your money and your filthy lucre is going to burn in hell with you. Glory to Almighty God. Somebody said, Brother Mike, tell them what you really feel. I think I just did. We ought to see you. That's where we are right now. And you're about to be cast into great tribulation. I hope you're not waiting for some kind of rapture while you're lying, laying down with your live-in lover, Laodicea. Get it, Laodicea. Get laid, get laid, laying up treasures. I hope you're not waiting for the trumpet to sound while you're playing the lottery. I hope you're not uh, waiting for the rapture to the trumpet to sound while you're in fornication and adultery and cussing and cheating and lying and stealing and watching porn and obsessed with greed. Covetousness, selfism, selfishness with luciferic pride and arrogance. There's no rapture for you. I might just preach a little bit today. Number one, our lust. James 4. <laughs> you have not because you ask not, but you have and don't get it because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. That's where we are today. James chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. He said, know ye not the love of this world is foolishness. 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Our language. We can't even talk without using the F word, the S word, the GD word, the N word. Number three, our lies. Our lasciviousness. Our lies. Number four, our licentiousness. This is why the perfect will does not happen in your life. This is why your prayers bounce off the ceiling. This is why the heavens are like brass. This is why you feel a million miles from God despite the fact that you go to church, despite the fact that you do all the outward trappings. You know deep down in your heart you're not right with God and that this preacher is right and you are wrong. Number five, our liquor. Our liquor. Number six, our adulterous leader, fornicator and abuser in chief. I don't care if you call him Trump or Biden. Same, there's not a dime's bit of difference. They're both liars. <laughs> Leading us to hellfire. Oh, I can't believe you said that, Brother Mike. Oh, I call out Donald Trump all the time. I'll get in his face. I'll tell Donald Trump the truth. I'll tell Joe Biden, woe unto Joe because of your sin. Joe Biden, woe unto Joe. The judgment of God is going to be extended, expanded, enlarged, and endless. I will tell the truth. I don't care. I will get in your face. I don't care the consequences. But the chips fall where they may fall. Our lucre. That's that money I just threw. 
That's your God. Filthy lucre is what the Bible calls it. The first, first Timothy 6 verse 10. For the love of money. The love of money. The love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. I said the love of money. I said the love of money. I said the love of money, honey. The love of money is the root of all evil. Filthy lucre. We need Christ, not cash. We need Christ, not credit cards. We need divinity, not debit cards. We need the divine, not debt. Eight, our likenesses. Our likenesses that we love too much. Our idols, images, icons, and likenesses that we like too much. Our entire society is about likenesses and images. And we worship people. And we worship men. And we worship goddesses of porn. And we worship actors on TV and we worship athletes and we bow down to them and we applaud after them and we stand after them and we yell and we scream and yet I get dozens of messages every day. Brother Mike, can you calm down? Can you quit shouting? Can you quit screaming? No! You can shout at a football game! Bless God, I can shout for Jesus Christ! Somebody stand and say glory! In this house of worship tonight, I'm about to preach. I'm excited about Jesus. You can get excited about a ball at a ball game. I'm excited about Jesus. Number nine, our lightness. Jeremiah 23, 32. By their lightness, the prophets, but I send them not. See, today we have gospel light. The gospel tastes great, but it's less filling. It's gospel light. And we have the incredible shrinking gospel because the shrinks have shrunk the gospel. Honey, I shrunk the gospel, Joel Osteen says to Victoria as he comes in from work every day. Our likeness. This message is to be a serious message. It is to be an intense message. It is to be a deep message. But today we have made it light. Gospel light. No longer do, do, do we thunder and demand holiness from the pulpit and lift our voice like a trumpet. No longer do we, do, do, do we demand sanctification and living rights. Now it's lightness. It's gospel light. We want to please the world instead of preach to the world. We want to entertain the world from our pulpits instead of evangelizing the world. We have become the world instead of winning the world. Reverse evangelism has occurred. I'm an evangelist. I believe that the Islamics, the Muslims, have to convert and come to Jesus. I'm an evangelist. I believe the Catholics have to give up the Pope and the former Virgin Mary and come to Jesus. I'm an evangelist. I believe a Hindu has to repent of a million gods of Hinduism and come to the one God, the one true God, Jehovah. I'm an evangelist. I believe the Jews need Jesus. I'm an evangelist. I believe the Buddhists need to melt down all the Buddha statues and come to the blood because Buddha can't help you, but the blood has all the help you need. The Bible, the broken body of Christ, has all the help you need. The problem with all these false religions is they don't have a cross. They don't have a cross. They don't have a savior. They don't have the Lamb of God. It's all about what they do and their religion. But religion is the first sin you have to repent of to be saved. I wish I had time to preach all this. It, it says here in, in, in the context of Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, I mean, the context is, is just dreadful. The context is, is just, there's really, there's no words to describe the context. I, I want you to look at verse 2 of chapter 26. Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to the cities of Judah, which come to worship at the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee, to speak unto them and diminish not a word. See, today we have the incredible shrinking gospel. The full gospel is no longer preached. It's a, it's a diminishing gospel. It's the incredible shrinking gospel. The shrinks have shrunk the gospel. And in our pulpit is a bunch of shrinks. They're not, they're not preachers. They are psychiatrists. But they don't understand 
the word of the Lord that says thou shalt surely die in chapter 26 and verse 8. They don't understand that. Verse 11, then spoke the priests and the prophets to the princes and to the people saying, this man is worthy to die. Talking about Jeremiah. They wanted to kill Jeremiah. Why? For one reason, for preaching the gospel. For preaching the gospel. But God says, hearken not to your prophets. This is, this is chapter 27 and verse 9 of Jeremiah. God says, don't listen to the preachers. It's the same thing I say. Don't listen to your mega church pastor, media church pastor, electronic church pastor. Don't hearken to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, to the occult, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak to, speak to you saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. They prophesy a lie unto you. They prophesy a lie unto you. Now I want you to go back to chapter 25 of Jeremiah. And I want you to notice verse 30. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes. The grapes. You ever heard the phrase from the book of Revelation? The grapes of wrath. The grapes of wrath. It's no longer preached from our pulpits today. They want to be nice. They want to tell you God's only a good God and a merciful God and a loving God. But they won't tell you the flip side. They won't tell you the other side of God. Joel Osteen won't tell you about the grapes of wrath. But the grapes of wrath are ripening today. And the harvest of the earth is ready. The harvest of the great supper of God. The grapes of wrath is here. And God is against the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with the nations. This is what the tribulation is going to be. This is what the great tribulation, the bowls, the seals, the trumpets, the vials, and the plagues, where over four billion, I said four billion with a B, are going to die in the next seven years. Thus says the Lord. This is God talking. And God hasn't changed. God cannot change. The God of the Old Testament is still the God of the New. The God of the Old Testament is still the God of the New. Thus says this is still, it was the age of grace then. There's only one way you ever got saved by grace. It was the age of grace in Jeremiah's day as much as it's the age of grace in today's day. Thus says the Lord. Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. A great whirlwind shall be raised from the coast of the earth. And look at verse 33 and weep. Weep and shudder and shake and quake and tremble. Shake. Let your knees tremble. Shake and quake and tremble in the fear and the terror of Almighty God. The slain of the Lord. This is causative. This is no longer permissive. This is God killing everybody. This is God drowning the whole world like he did in the days of Noah. This is God frying the world like he did Sodom and Gomorrah to a crisp like KFC and Popeyes. The slain of the Lord. This isn't the devil's doing. This isn't the devil's doing. This is the slain of the Lord. Shall be at that day, judgment day, the day of the Lord. From one end of the earth to the other. Neither shall they be lamented. Verse 34. Howl, you shepherds. The slain of the Lord, the diminishing gospel. Today, we do not have an apostolic revival. We have an apostasy. We have an apostasy. We have an apostasy. And the apostasy begins with the prophets. It's a fourfold apostasy. A fourfold apostasy. It begins with the prophets, false prophets, false teachers. And it goes to the priest. This is verse, chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priest, and to the prophets, and to all the people. 
And then in verse 2, to the princess. It's a fourfold apostasy from the prophets to the princes, to the to the priest, to the princes, and to the people. It starts at the top. It dies from the top down. It goes down. That's what's happened today. First, our pulpits were corrupted. And then our people were corrupted. And now our princes, our politicians are corrupted. We saw the scandal of the priest. The molestation scandal with the priest. Our priests were corrupted. Our prophets are corrupted. If, if you think Kenneth Copeland is saved, I got a good deal for you on the Brooklyn Bridge. If you think Benny Hinn is saved or Paula White is saved, I got a good deal for you. On some oceanfront property out there in Arizona. Handala motele quero do santo corre sad. When a preacher dies, because they're not resting in peace, they're not going to heaven. Paul Youngi Cho died a couple days ago. He's in hell. The fourth dimension was occult. It led the church to the occult. Fred Price died a few months ago. He's paying the price and we'll be trying to pay the price forever in hell because he chose prosperity over the preaching of truth. The people listen to these false prophets and they trust in a lie. Look at chapter 28 and verse 15. Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah, the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent thee, but thou makest the people to trust in a lie. That's what's going on today. From Lakewood Church, Joel Osteen, to Saddleback Church and Rick Warren, to Willow Creek and, the, and, and Bill Hybels, all the way to Elevation Church, Elevation Church and Stephen Furtick, to Family Worship Center in Baton Rouge. Listen to me. And to Victory Christian Center. Listen to me. To Rama Bible Church. The people are trusting in lies. The preacher says, I've been sent. And the preacher says, God told me to tell you to give me all your money so you can be rich. It's a lie. It's a scam. It's the God con. Seed faith is serpent faith. Seed faith is a slithering snake. It's a slithering serpent. Seed faith. It's a scheme. It's a scam. It's a sham. It's the God God give to get. Shame on all of them. They're not called of God. And they're making people believe a lie. But alas, Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. That's a lot of people's favorite verse, and it ought to be. John chapter 8. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Free from these preachers. Free from the evil empire of religion. Free from these false lies. The truth shall set you free. Ladies and gentlemen, what I am giving you today is the ABCs of systematic theology. Somebody says, well, doctrine bores me, Brother Mike. Friend, if the Bible bores you, you're not saved. Get to these altars and get saved. The ABCs of systematic theology. I, I got a lot more material. There's a whole lot more to cover. We'll have to get to it tomorrow. Because right now the Spirit of God is saying, Mike, cast a net. I'm going to open these altars. I'm not going to give a formal altar call and pray a sinner's prayer today. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to fall on your knees and fall on your face before God. And I'm going to ask you right now to repent. Repent of loving money. Repent of loving money. Repent of loving money. Repent of your lies. Loving, filthy Luke. Repent of your lust. Repent of your living together in sin. Repent right now. Anda la bushatur, anda la bushatala bushate. 
Oh, God, forgive them. And in the book of Joel, it says that we are to weep between the porch and the altar. It says that we are to beat our breast. Hallelujah. It says we are to rend our heart and not our garment. I don't care what Joel Osteen says. I care what the book of Joel says. The reason... You don't have God's best. The reason you don't have Jeremiah 29, 11 in your life is because of the sin in your life. Sin is the problem. And there's only one cure to sin. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask backsliders to come back to God. Normally I give invitations for people that have never accepted the Lord. But today, there are literally, the Lord tells me right now, there are thousands of backsliders who once knew the Lord, who once had the first love, but you've walked away. You've let drugs and alcohol and illicit sex and gambling and porn and lying and cheating and cussing and idols, images, and icons destroy your Christian life and you've gone shipwreck and you're a backslider in heart. And you know what I'm preaching today is true. God is calling you home. The prodigal son ran. It's hard to run from God. It's hard to turn out the light. The prodigal son, he went away and he fed pigs. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit came and he came back. He came back. Today you can come back to God. And I want you to just wherever you are right now, close your eyes and lift your hands. And say, Lord, I'm coming back. Like the prodigal son of old. I'm coming back. Take me back. I know your word said you'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me to the end of the age. I'm taking you up on that right now. I know your thoughts toward me are thoughts of peace and thoughts of good. Right now, Lord, take me back. I repent of all my sin. Forgive me. I come to the cross. And I ask for grace to help in the time of need. Lord, wash me in the precious blood of Jesus. Lord, I'm coming home. Never more to roam. Lord, I'm coming home. And God, right now, will receive them back. And God, I'm asking you right now to refill them with the Holy Spirit. Heal their bodies. Heal their marriages. Restore and reconcile them to their first wife or first husband. Restore and reconcile them to their church, to their children. God, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus right now to put homes and marriages and family back together. Come back together. Hallelujah. According to what men says is impossible, God says nothing. It's impossible to him that believes. The doctor said there's no hope. You about to go on a vent. There is hope. God can turn it around. God can turn it around. God can do the impossible. That cancer, they say it's terminal. Jesus can heal it. Believe him today. Believe him today. Glory to God. Father, I just pray right now. I pray for everyone listening to me right now that you draw them and bring them back to the bleeding side of Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. If I can pray with you personally, counsel with you personally, you can reach me 24-7. Text first, 703-405-1942. 703-405-1942. Pastors, this kind of revival, this kind of move of God can come in your pulpit. You have not because you ask not. 703-405-1942. I'm available for your convention, camp meeting, conference, corporate outing. Text me, call me 24-7, 703-405-1942. Write me, hit, send a comment wherever you follow me. TikTok at Evangelist Mike Dial. TikTok at Evangelist Mike Dial. Give me a public testimony of what God has done for you. Healing, deliverance, miracle, salvation, leading, guidance. Praise God. I don't ask for money, donations, contributions. If God tells you to give, though, that's another matter. I'll receive it. And the way I do it is through my Venmo. It's one word, 
at Evangelist Mike Dahl, Evangelist Mike Dahl, capital E, capital M, capital D. Evangelist Mike Dial. That's all I'm going to say about it. Until we talk again, this is Evangelist Mike Dial telling you, I love you. Follow me on TikTok at Evangelist Mike Dial. Follow me on Twitter, Evangelist M Dial. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And remember, Jesus is still your answer. And he always will be, always and forever. Amen and amen. Praise God.